In today's Gospel, St. Luke tells us that in the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus read to the assembly the words of the prophet Isaiah, closed the book, and declared, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. At first his hearers spoke well of him and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Of course, the answer to their question is actually no. Despite appearances, Jesus is not the natural son of Joseph. The angel Gabriel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Because the people of Nazareth looked upon Jesus as a mere man, as merely the son of their neighbor Joseph, their initially favorable response became one of unbelief and opposition. All in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and put him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down headlong. What had so angered his hearers in the synagogue? Jesus had reminded them that God can act in unexpected ways among unlikely people. Our Savior recalled that the prophet Elijah, in a time of famine and persecution, was sent to a Gentile widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon, beyond the boundaries of the Holy Land. Likewise, the prophet Elisha told Naaman the Syrian, another non-Israelite, to wash seven times in the river Jordan to be healed of his leprosy. Naaman refused at first, irritated by what seemed a pointless symbolic act. And yet, at last, Naaman did as the prophet said, and was healed, and so came to believe in the God of Israel. Jesus was challenging his hearers' expectations of how God may act. Jesus was human, and yet his actions and words and forgiving of sins in his own name implied divinity. He called for faith in his very person, in a way that, for Jews, could be directed only to God. Our Redeemer's opponents in Israel would later say to him, We stone you for no good work but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, Make yourself God. Jesus was disturbing to Gentiles as well as to Jews. There were many Naamans among the Greeks and Romans and other peoples of the ancient world who thought it was narrow-minded to say that salvation is from the Jews. And yet Jesus said precisely that to the Samaritan woman at the well. Salvation is on God's terms, not on ours. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus Christ, the eternal love of God in human flesh, spoke those words. We must not be ashamed of the gospel. Christ is both inclusive and exclusive. He is the one and only Savior. But his cross is the gate of salvation open to all mankind. Peter preached to his fellow Israelites that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name other than the name of Jesus, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. As St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Christian faith is ultimately in the triune God alone. This act of faith is rightly made from within the church, which is the community of faith. 
The church is mankind itself, redeemed and reunited in Christ. For a baptized Catholic to speak of leaving the church is as foolish and absurd as to speak of leaving the human race or of changing one's ancestry. Christ's followers need to belong to a visible, social, structured body, to his church, because the social dimension is an essential part of the humanity that Christ came to save. Whether we like it or not, we human beings are interdependent. Archbishop Fulton Sheen put it this way, Say not, then, religion is a private affair, any more than your birth is a private affair. You cannot be born alone, you cannot live alone, you cannot even die alone, for your death is tied up with property or at least with or at least with burial. You cannot practice religion alone any more than you can love alone. The Catechism speaks of the Church, especially in three biblical terms as the people of God, as the body of Christ, and as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Of these, the most important is the New Testament description of the Church as the body of Christ. The expression body of Christ likens the Church to a living body, a living organism. St. Paul writes to the Romans, For as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. The Church is also called the Bride of Christ, for she is one flesh, one body with her Lord, cleansed by water and the Word in baptism. The Church is one because God, the Trinity in unity, is one, and because Christ, who is God and man, is one, and because the Holy Spirit is the unifying soul of Christ's mystical body. We profess one faith, have the same worship and sacraments, and preserve succession from the apostles through the bishops, priests, and deacons. We hold also that the church is holy. The church is holy because Jesus Christ, her divine head, is holy, and because the Holy Spirit continually gives life to the church. The church is holy despite the presence of sinners within the visible church on earth. To be more specific, the church is holy in three ways that no sin can ever efface. First, the church hands on a holy doctrine that comes from the apostles. So St. Paul says that the church of the living God is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. Second, The sacraments are holy, because they communicate to us Christ himself, who is God's Holy One. And third, the Church is holy because the grace at work in her produces saints, that is, men and women transformed in Christ. St. Paul writes to the Corinthians that we regard no one from a merely natural and human standpoint. Christ, who is truly God and man, has redeemed our humanity and made us a new creation. We do not give up on the Catholic Church because in Christ we are ourselves God's Church, and God in Christ has not given up on us. So we cannot give up hoping for one another. Some in Nazareth beheld Jesus in the flesh and saw only the son of Joseph, Some today behold the church and see only a human institution or a troubled community. But the eye of faith sees in Christ and his church the mystery of God made man, of our Emmanuel, of God with us and among us. To see the church without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish, we turn our eyes to the Blessed Virgin Mary the Immaculate Mother of God, for in her the Church is already all holy, as she shall be in heavenly glory.